Welcome to the house of God. Welcome to City Light, City Light Church. We're so glad to see you here this morning. Yeah, kids, you are dismissed. Sorry, I forgot to announce that. Welcome to those watching online too as well. You know, um, we're living in difficult times, yet these can be the best of times with God, right? Anytime, in any place where God is, that's the blessed, best place to be. I want to tell you, God is in the house. Holy Spirit is here right now to minister to you. Amen? Let's bow our heads and let's God's, ask God's blessing on the word we're about to hear. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us ears to hear and hearts to believe. And you've given us faith to believe for the impossible. I pray that this word would build up faith within us. That we would hear truth that liberates us and sets us free so we can be the people we were called to be, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. We're in a series called Not the Same. You know, the world is not the same anymore. And so many things that, that we do and how we live cannot be the same. But there's one thing that's always going to be this, the same, and that's God. That's amen. Jesus. Amen? He's the rock of our salvation. He's the source of our strength. He's, he's going to be there. He's with us no matter what, no matter where. And he loves us no matter who we are. Amen? Amen. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. Not the same. Today I'm going to talk about your speech. Not the same speech. Listen to this statement. It's on the PowerPoint. What you see, what you perceive, in other words, what you see and understand, and what you believe, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about your life, and what you speak will, not just can, I believe it will determine your future, and it can determine the future of people around you. Now, we can see this very statement, this very truth, lived out in the classic story that took place in the Old Testament in the Bible, in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. This is the story. It's, it's all about, Numbers is about, it's talking about God's people, Israel. The, they were in Egypt for like 400 plus years in bondage and slavery, and God brings them out and takes them in supernaturally through Moses, and they enter this place called the desert, and they wander around that desert for a long, long time, for decades. And finally, they come to the edge of the promised land, and they're ready to, to, to go into this place called the promised land. I mean, their, their hopes and dreams are, are all about their next destination. But before they do, Joshua decides to do something wise. He picks up 12 leaders, 12 spies, to go into the land to check it out. What kind of land is it? Who lives there? What kind of people? Are the cities without walls or are they fortified? What's the fruit and the products, uh, products like? What's the soil? Is it good or is it bad? So that's what they do. So for 40 days, these 12 spies go into the promised land. Numbers 13, 25. It says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. They brought some produce back, and it was amazing. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent, to, uh, sent us to explore, and it is, it is indeed a bountiful country, a country flowing with milk and honey. Here is the, ki the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And at that point, the whole community was so excited until they heard about this thing called giants, and they freaked out. They freaked out. They said, what? Giants? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> giants? Is there such a thing? Well, the, the whole community is in an uproar. And then verse 30 says, Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. 
But the other men who had explored the land with them disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. And so they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through, will, through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw, and there it comes again, that word. What was that? Giants. We even saw giants. They're the, accent, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. And the whole community began to complain and grumble. Question, what does God think? Numbers 14, 26, fast forward. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. You will all drop dead in the wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who was 20 years older, 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Zephaniah, and Joshua, son of Nun. That verse 28 stands out. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things that what? I heard you say. There's a huge lesson in this story for all of us. Today we're talking about our words. We're talking about our speech. First point, your words, our words, are creative. They have power to create. Hebrews 11, verse 13 says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. So how was our world created? How? Words. Words created all our world. And when we speak, our words create. Do we understand that? Every word that comes out of our mouths has some power. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. See, we create, we create with our words rooms, I call it spaces, atmospheres with our words that others can step into or step out of. Our words create atmosphere. I say space, where people want to be, where you want to be, or where you don't want to be. Words form a world where we feel safe or unsafe, we feel wanted or unwanted, loved or unloved, and we just go keep going on, accepted or rejected. I want to encourage you, to, s to create rooms of hope and love and grace with God's word coming out of your mouth. Amen? What impact can we have? Your words have such impact. Your words do other, uh, one of two things. Here's some things. Your words can harm or your words can heal. Your words can undermine and destroy or your words can protect and strengthen. Your words can pervert things or your words can straighten things out. Your words can deceive or your words can be truthful and, and speak truth that sets people free. Your words can be hurtful or they could be harmful. Your words can be life or your words can be death. Amen? And there's no middle ground. There's no middle. Today, what would God think about the words that you're speaking? What would God thinks, think about your words? Would God want to stay in your room, in your space, in your atmosphere? What do you want to do? What would he hear? Would, you, you know, would, you, would his words attract you? Would he hear words of strength and encouragement? 
Or would he hear words of doubt and unbelief and worry and fear? See, here in Numbers 13 and 14, Moses handpicks 12 men, 12 outstanding leaders from among the tribes, and he sends these 12 men to spy the land. Now, these spies don't realize that God is listening and God is watching. Now, out of the 12 spies that Moses sent back, 10 come back with a doubt report, 2 come back with a faith report. 10 have negative reports, 2 have positive reports. 10 report giants, 2 report giant opportunities. 10 report we can't, 2 report we can. 10 report we seem like grasshoppers, 2 report but God is greater and we can do it. Question, what I ask you, what's your report? What's your report about your future? What's your report about your finances? What's your report about your kids and your family? Are you in the camp of the 10 or are you in the camp of the two? Just, I want to look at these, just look at these, these two different camps. Look at the two men with the faith report. Joshua. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim means fruitful. He was not just fruitful, he was also very faithful. Joshua was an incredible man of faith. He was faithful to God. He was faithful as a servant when he served Moses. He was so full of faith. Full of faith means full of fruit. And he ends up being a leader after Moses dies. He's strong, he's courageous, and he leads that next generation into the promised land. And he made powerful declarations of faith like, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's a man of faith, and he's a fruitful man. Look at the next guy, Caleb. In Hebrew, that, that name Caleb means dog. That's a good, good um, name for your pit bull. Caleb, right? Strong, strong, faithful. His name it means dog, means faithful. Caleb came from the tribe of Judah, and Judah means praise. Caleb was a man of faith, and he was a man of praise. He was always full of faith, always praising God. Notice the words he spoke. Verse 30, let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. Joshua 14, 10, here I am this day, 85 years old, yet I am as strong this, uh, this, day, in the, strong this day as the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Verse 12, now therefore, give me this mountain, of which the Lord spoke in that day. He says, give it to me. I'm ready for it. And verse 13 says, and Joshua blessed him, and he gave him Hebron. Hebron is not just an ordinary place. It's a special place. Hebron, he gave Hebron to Caleb as an inheritance because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was, and this is so important, it's Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Who was the Anakim? Who was the Anakim? They were the giants. Caleb, history reports that when Caleb, there was a race of giants living in Canaan land that were occupying this huge area of the best country in the, all the promised land. And they were, they were, they were it was overrun. It was, it was you know, they, they, had the, they literally had the best land. Caleb almost single-handedly with his family and his army, almost entirely wiped, wiped out that, that generation, that race of giants on the earth, except for just a few, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Anakin were giants. He got the very best land where the, lions, where the giants lived. Okay, that's the two. Let's look at the, the ten spies. What happened to the ten spies? Here's what happened. They die in the desert. They never see the promised land again. They miss out on what God, what God would do. And because of their speech, up to two million people never entered the promised land. What you, what, you, what you see, what you believe, and what you say can determine your future and the future of many of those around you. Amen? Let's not be a part of the ten. Let's be a part of the two. You know, you know it's time to speak up. It's time to speak the promises of God over your life. It's time that we walk in the favor and the blessings of God. 
question. Are there going to be giants in our life today? Yeah. Are there going to be obstacles? Are there going to be Jerichos? Walls which need to come tumbling down? Yes, they're, they're going to be. You know, perhaps the greatest giant story ever, and you'll probably agree with me, is the story of David and Goliath. Classic story. I don't know how many times I've preached on this, but every time you preach on it, there's something else that the that Lord seems to reveal out of this story. It's, it's an awesome story of David and Goliath. It's a story of two armies. The armies of Israel, God's people, camped on one side of the valley of Elah, and, the, and the, the armies of their worst enemy, the Philistine. Philistine, that, that word Philistine means snake or serpent. The op, op, opposer of God's people. We still have that opposition in our world today, don't we? You know, and there's these two armies, and they're separated. And Goliath, who is a descendant of Anakim, he's 10 feet tall. Some people say he's, uh, the Bible actually says he's 9.5. Nine feet, nine inches tall, but actually some scholars say they found bodies. I heard they found bodies and skeletons. They're way taller than that, 10, 11 feet tall. I mean, this guy was huge, and this guy was muscle-bound, and he had a big barrel chest, and therefore he's got huge lungs, and he's got this incredible vocal cords, and when he bellowed and he shouted, I mean, it was like he didn't need a microphone. He didn't need a, his voice was like a megaphone. And he would shout. He would come up in the battle lines. And every day, day after day, week after week, he would shout inti uh, intimidating things, fearful things, intimidations, threats against the, the armies of Israel. And he'd just do that day after day. Blah, 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 blah. Keep on with this, 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 this barrage of, of, of words. And the entire army of Israel just stood there and he listened, shaking in their boots, so Goliath, with his words, pounded fear into them. He poured fear into them until that fear literally turned into paranoia and phobia. And he did that not just once a day. He did that twice a day. He, day after day, week after week, month after month, he did this. You know, I heard a message by Leon Fontaine when he talked about this story. And you know what Leon said? He said, reminds me of the last couple of years. Reminds me of the last couple of years. And he said, this is what he said in his message. The fastest way to control any group of people is to pour fear into them. And once fear is poured into them, you, you, and you keep pouring fear into them, they get past fear until it becomes phobia. And then you can do to them anything, and you can do it quickly. That is so true. We are living in a time in the world right now where we are hearing a lot of words. And a lot of these words are misinformation and they're deception. We need to discern what is truth and what is deception. And, it, and you know, and so many of these words are bringing a lot of fear into people, into our country. He goes on to say, if you really care for people, you would never use fear. You would instruct them. You would let them know of the dangers of the situation. You wouldn't censor information. You would give them all the information so that they can rise up and know what's going on. We need to know what's going on. And the, the Bible is full of warnings about not hearing, believing everything you hear. He says, use wisdom. He says, we are a people of wisdom, knowledge, and understand. I mean, how do you build a life? By wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, it's filled with rare and beautiful treasures. We need to hear truth. Don't believe everything you hear. Listen, this world does not care about you. There are leaders and there are people that are governing in our world, rulers and powers, that don't care about you like God cares about you. Amen? Yes. Let me tell you, some, I'm not saying everybody's like that. Some have good contentions, but listen, so much of what I'm hearing today is not for the well-being and the benefit of, of, of the greater the benefit of people. You know, here's the... Uh, 
amazing thing I hear in this story. <coughs> in the 40 days, the most powerful army on the face of the earth, skilled in battle and warfare, special battle skills, are quaking in fear. A people with a history, a powerful history, who came out of Egypt with the cloud covering by day and the fire by night to protect them. People who struck fear in the heart of all other peoples as they passed through the wilderness in the desert because the hand of God was upon them. Amen? And now this army, this powerful people, this army, are literally shaking in fear, knees knocking, teeth chattering. Why? Because they were pickled in fear. That's what Leon said. They were pickled in fear. By Goliath's words, you can control an entire country with your words. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David shows up on the battle scene. Just as Goliath is coming forth, shouting, bellowing, spouting out his threats and his lies. So what's Israel's army's response? Well, they run. They hide. They run from the battle line. And they're just shaking in fear. But David's response is different. David's watching what's, he, what's going on. He, he hears this guy, Goliath, shouting intimidation and threats. And he sees all these brave so-called brave warriors, literally, run for the battle line. He's, David's just standing by himself, <coughs> wondering what's happening. He said, what's going on here? David, David's response is different. What does David do? He says, what's, he, David says, who is this guy anyway? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Like, who is this guy? So the question is, why was David's response different? You know why it was different? Because David had just come from his father's fields, from tending the sheep, from serving his father, from worshiping his God, and he was not pickled in fear. And David's words are overheard by the, by, they're overheard. And they bring, him to, they, they, they bring David to, to Saul. And Saul says, and David says, you know, don't worry about anything because I'll take on this giant. I'll take him on. And Saul says, you can't do it. Well, you're just a boy. He's a seasoned warrior with a track record of, you know, victories and he's a champion but David said no problem I can take him on I've got a track record too he says I'm a shepherd he says I fought the lion and the bear and when one of them took a hold of my sheep I went after him I grabbed him by the hair and I killed him he says this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like him he's going down long story short David ends up facing that giant with just a sling, and five stones. Some people say, well, David wasn't quite sure of himself. That's why he needed five stones. But it's not true. David only needed one, he only needed one stone. What were the other four stones for? Yeah, for Goliath's, for, for Goliath's brothers, right? He had four brothers, and David said, in case those guys show up, I've got a stone for them too as well. <laughs> First Samuel 17, 37. David walked out toward, sorry, Goliath walked out toward David, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Goliath yelled. But what did David do? He didn't get into any, any argument. He says, no, that's not going to happen. That's not the way it's, nope. But what David did was he just spoke the truth. Verse 26 these are the words he spoke to, Gol to Goliath. Today, the Lord, the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you, and I will cut off your head, 
And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled there will know that the Lord, what does he do? He rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and I tell you, the one they're in right now, this is the Lord's battle as well, and he will give you to us. Powerful words. Words are powerful. And David took out that giant with just a single stone, and that giant fell for it with a thud. Amen? The bigger they are, finish it, the harder they fall. Amen? Today I want to encourage you to have that spirit of faith. Speak words of faith. God can, we can, I can do anything, right? I can do all things. We think about Jesus. Jesus was always attracted to faith. Jesus was always able to do miracles in a faith environment. Think about it. Remember the four guys with their friend? They brought their paralytic friend on the roof and they lowered him right to the roof. What did Jesus say? Because of their faith. He saw their faith. Amen? Remember the woman with the issue, chronic issue of blood for 12 years? She pushed through the crowd. She crawled on the ground and she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And she did and she was healed. Think about all the other people. Think about that Roman soldier with a servant that was sick. Came to Jesus and Jesus said, well, I'll go and I'll heal him. And, and the Roman soldier said, no, you don't have to go. He says, just say the word. Just say the word, and he'll be healed. And his servant was healed. Listen, there are going to be challenges. In the time that we're living in, we have challenges. We have obstacles. We have giants. But listen, I want to tell you, God is greater. Amen. God is greater. Yeah. We have a great God who can o- overcome any obstacle, any opposition, any political leader, any world leader, any, you know, the person with the most amount of wealth in this, in, in this world has nothing compared to what God has. Amen? It's time to take the land. It's time to take the land. Do you agree with me? It's time to reach our city for God. It's time to start to dream big dreams. It's time to make an impact with our life. It's time to step up in faith, step out in faith. Amen? And for some of us, I would say it's time for some of us to start new businesses. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying we have a life and we have a future. Some of you need to start businesses. Some of you know, we need to start praying bolder prayers. Amen? Bold prayers. It's time to take steps of faith and it's time to see the hand of God move. I'm ready to see the hand of God move. Say, God, move! I want to see your presence and your power in our land. And we think about it. Ten and two. Ten and two. It's no different today. You will be outnumbered. You will be outnumbered. There'll always be 10 to 2. There'll always be more people who are negative than positive. There will be always more people who are, who are fearful rather than faithful. You know, it's, you know it's, it's always 10 to 2. But can I encourage you? Be one of the two. Be one of the two. Be like Joshua and Caleb who always rise up to bless, to strengthen, to encourage who speak words of faith and words of courage and words of future. Amen? And can I say this? And don't lean to the negative. Don't lean to the negative. And I could be one who easily leans to the negative. And I, sometimes I could need to slap my face and say, shut your mouth, you know, and, and, and be different. Let's be positive too as well. You know, let's open our mouths to bring life. Let's open our mouths to bring life. Let's speak to the mountains. Amen? Proverbs 15.4. When you speak healing words, what do you do? You offer others fruit from the tree of life. God is a tree of life. But unhealthy, negative words do nothing but crush their hopes. Crush their hopes. Crush their spirits. The tree of life is life-giving, helpful, encouraging, wise. I say, little, let's, dedic- let's dedicate our mouths to God. Let's dedicate it to God, right? Let's speak God's word. You know, and, and let's fill it with praise. Let's be like Caleb. Let's fill it with praise. You know, how can negative words keep coming out of your mouth if you always fill it with praise, right? 
And this is what Hebrews says, continually offer to God, not just once in a while, continually offer to, offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips that profess his name. Let's, be, let's fill it with praise. And, and can I just add, sometimes you gotta shut your big, fat mouth. Sometimes you gotta just zip it, shut it, close it. It's way better to say nothing sometimes and let something spew out of your mouth, you know, unthoughtfully, right? The prophet says, even a fool is thought to be wise if he keeps quiet. Words are powerful. They either bring life or they either bring death. Make sure that your life, your words, are bringing life. Amen? Because what you see and what you believe and what you say will determine your future. Amen? Here's another question. What do you see about your life? What do you see about your future? What do you see about your finances? What do you see in the next year coming up, the next season? What do you imagine? What are you seeing? What are you believing for? You know, what are you speaking? And that's so important, isn't it? And, 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 and such a, a, a great part of our lives, the people of God, is the church. The church is the greatest organization on the face of the earth. This world will go as the church goes. The church advances the kingdom of God. And you and I, we are the church. We're part of something so big, so incredible, so powerful, so important. And as it goes, goes to church, so goes your life, right? So we need to say, m you know, my life and, and I, your life is, is, is wrapped up as a believer in Christ with Jesus the head and us being a part of the body and the body is called the church. We need to have a vision for the church as well. So question is, what do you see and what do you say about the church? What do you see for yourself, for the church? Here's what I see. As a leader over this house, as a heart, as a man who has a heart over this house, this is what I see for our church. So many people have given up on the church, but I've never given up on a church because the church is the hope of the world. Here's what I believe. Yeah, let's give Jesus a hand for his church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you ready for this? Here's what I see for the church. The City Light Church I see is visionary, faith-filled, focused on impacting people for Jesus Christ, helping them to find a home in his church. The City Light Church I see is full, smiling faces and warm embraces that welcomes every single person with open arms, reaching those who are far from God and also those who are returning to Jesus Christ once again. The church I see is an ever-flowing fountain of, of encouragement, life, and strength to anyone who walks through those doors. The church I see heals hurts as it meets the need of people in our community, in our neighborhood, in our city, and in our region. The church I see is an interconnected family a place where no matter what your age, background, nationality, you are embraced, you belong, and you're a part of all that God is doing. The church I see is a church full of passion. I see kids, I see young people, I see young at heart, lifting hands and hearts in worship, in full abandonment to God. A church where God is revered and honored. The church I see is a place of laughter, connection, and relationship where people come early and they stay late because they want to connect. The church I see is the place where everyone is empowered in their gifts, their talents, and their abilities. The church I see is a place where, is, is a church whose leaders are raised up in their calling, but they understand that what they're a part of is greater than just the part that they play. And the church I see has a leadership that leads with integrity and humility and unity. And the church I see is a place for people to belong to, to believe, and to build God's amazing church together. And the church I see brings pleasure and glory to God and represents his name well on this earth. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know, let's see it. Let's believe it. Let's speak it. 
and let's see what God do. Let's see what God will do for your family, for your finances, for your future. Amen? Amen. 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 Please stand. I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different today, and I'm going to ask you to stand, and you don't have to. <coughs> you don't have to do this, but I would like you to do this. I think the Lord would like you to do this. Are you ready? This is what I want you to do. I want you to put a hand on your tongue, on your, on your mouth, and I want you to declare, and I want you to declare it, and to dedicate, to dedicate your tongue to God, your mouth to God. Do you want to do that this morning? We need help. I need help with this tongue. So I'm going asking God for help here. And I want you to repeat after me, okay? Repeat after me. Are you ready for this? You don't say it to me. You say it to God, right? And he's going to hear every single word. Are you ready? Lord Jesus Christ, this tongue is dedicated. This tongue will praise God. This mouth will shut when needed. This mouth will open to bring life. Okay, now I want you to speak God's blessing over your life. Are you ready? Say, repeat after me. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not below. I am blessed in the city. I am blessed in the country. I will have more than enough, and my children will be blessed. And if you agree with this, shout an amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for a minute. Bow your heads. You know, the most powerful thing that the tongue does is establish your faith. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Today here, if you're here, and you've never asked Christ into your heart, you've never received the Holy Spirit in your heart, then you could do it now, today. This is the greatest decision you will ever, ever make in your life. So if you're ready to do that, you're ready to surrender your old life and to receive this new life that Christ has for you, then repeat after me. Are you ready for this? Now, on, I'm, 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 I'm speaking to those online too. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I repent of my sins. I thank you that all my sins are forgiven through his precious blood. Today, I invite and I receive you into my heart to be Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Now just keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. Now if you said that prayer, for the very first time, I want you to raise your hand. If you're online, I want you to touch that hand at the bottom of the screen. You raise your hand if you said that prayer. If you said that prayer, raise it and wave it. And then I want you to go right after this to, the, to that lamp over there. Victor's standing there. It's called the Welcome Lounge. It's right at the back here. And I want to tell you, there's a next step of faith that God has for you in your, in your incredible journey and your life with God. Will you go back there and speak to, to Victor? And if you, if you, you said that prayer online and you, and you touch that hand, then we will connect you with someone who will tell you what your next faith step with God is too as well. Amen? Amen. If you said that prayer, I say welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the greatest decision ever. Welcome to heaven as your destiny. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord.